Now, what your body carries may be painful sometimes. But if I'm committed to the compassion of truth, I will not protect you from feeling the pain that's already in you. I will not, I will not impose pain on you. I will not create situations so that deliberately so that you feel pain. But when that pain shows up, I'm going to help you see that that's the truth of your existence as you've been living it until now. Not vindictively, but so that you can do something about it. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and today I'm speaking with author Dr. Gabor Mate. Gabor is highly sought after for his expertise working with addiction, stress, and childhood development. He's written several best-selling books, including the award-winning In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, When the Body Says No, and Scattered, and co-authored the book Hold On to Your Kids. His works have been published internationally in nearly 30 languages. Gabor's new book, The Myth of Normal, has just been released in September of 2022. So a very warm welcome to you. It's so nice to be together again. Congratulations on your new book. It was such a um, a pleasure and a, a kind of a, a wonderful feeling connecting recently. And you're doing such amazing and interesting work in the field. So I'm I'm delighted to have you here today. So let's talk about your book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. I love the title and the subtitle, by the way, because it uh, if you're thinking in terms of blame, let's let's look uh, in a broader scope. So maybe the place to start, I'm sure you're answering this question a million times, um, is how do you define normal? So normal has uh the word normal has a entirely proper um usage when we refer to something that's natural and healthy and necessary so as a physician i can tell you that outside a normal range of physiological parameters life is not possible you know outside a certain age of body temperature or, or blood acidity um or blood pressure we don't. We can't live. So that's the normal range, you know, no, healthy and natural, that can sustain life and health. Now the myth comes in when in our culture we assume that the way we live and the way this culture is organized and the values of it and how we conduct ourselves in it, because it's the norm. That's how we do it. Statistically, it's the norm. That therefore is also natural and healthy. And what I'm suggesting is that what is considered normal in this society is actually toxic to human well-being in a physiological and uh, psychological and spiritual sense. So that the second meaning of the myth of normal then is that the assumption, therefore, that people who get sick, who get illness mentally or physically, those are considered abnormal. I'm saying no. Those are normal responses to an abnormal environment. So there's a myth of normal on those two levels. I once heard trauma, the term trauma, referred to as a a normal reaction to an abnormal environment. Um, so it's a little bit like that, right? Well, yes. Uh, when you hurt any creature and it becomes defensive or suspicious or fearful or aggressive, those are normal responses to an abnormal situation that never should have happened in the first place. Or if uh, a child is in a situation that's very difficult to endure emotionally and or physically, and therefore they disconnect with their body, and that disconnection is the essence of trauma, but that's a very normal response mm -hmm. to an abnormal circumstance. So that disconnection, which is the trauma, the traumatic wound, 
is also a normal response to an abnormal circumstance. And I could talk about all the manifestations of trauma in mental health, whether it's depression, anxiety, psychosis, um, the tuning out of ADD, um, mood swings, uh, or, or physiological conditions that, that show up as physical disease in the body. These are normal responses to abnormal traumatizing circumstances. Would you also say that one way of looking at what's normal is the range within which uh, adaptation can still happen? Like one can be heading toward illness and make a turn maybe toward health or a system can uh, shift with shifting conditions instead of being rigid and held in the past and that there gets to be a, a place or an extreme where that kind of adaptation is not so readily at hand anymore and we're kind of stuck. Well, I was just reading the Dostoevsky's um, House of the Dead, which is a semi, barely autobiography, barely fictionalized autobiography of his stint in a Siberian prison camp during Tsarist times in the 19th century. And one of the things he said, and I'm paraphrasing, is that men, men can get used to anything, and that maybe is their most noticeable characteristic. Mm. So we can get used to almost anything, but that doesn't mean that we'll function very well in all circumstances. So mm-hmm. evolution prepared us to live within a certain set of circumstances and experiences and relationships to ourselves, to other people, and to nature. Now, we can sustain life. Human beings are more adaptable than any other mammal, for sure. So we can sustain life far away from those evolutionary conditions. But that doesn't mean that we'll be be doing at our best in those conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when those conditions take us far away from our essential emotional nature, we're going to suffer. So we can, yeah, we can adapt. But that doesn't mean that we do very well. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's why um, that sort of alienation from our our essential emotional nature and and what, might be healing. Um, do you think that's why we're seeing a rise in chronic illness and addiction, no matter what else is happening in terms of food availability or whatever? Well, there was an article in the New York Times 10 days before we speak, which is to say the Sunday New York Times sometime late in August 2022. Front page headline article about a teenager who's on 10 different psychiatric medications, mm. 10 different psychiatric medications given to an adolescent. Now, this is almost the norm in the United States. It's an extreme, but it's not far out of the mainstream experience where the number of children and adolescents being diagnosed with all manner of psychiatric disorders is rising significantly. There's all kinds of hand-wringing in the press as there was in the New York Times and the New Yorker within the last few months, about the rising tide of childhood suicides. Mm. We're medicating our kids left, right, and center for all manner of conditions. The average American adult, 70% of adults in the States are on at least one medication. Uh, About 40 to 50% are on two medications. And either we assume that there's some kind of a mysterious pandemic of pathology for which we don't know the cause. Or we say, well, what is it in the conditions of life in this culture that is driving this level of pathology? And I'm saying that it's the very nature of this culture to engender illness um, because it's so far removed from our evolutionary needs as human beings. Well, interconnection is a big theme in your book, and I wonder how that relates to that sort of kind of primary um, evolutionary need, you know? Sure. So, shall I tell you how a baby elephant is born? Mm. When a baby elephant is born, when when a mom goes into labor, the mother elephants stand around in a circle. When the infant elephant hits the ground... All the mothers 
stroke them with their trunks. Mm. Birth in amongst elephants is a communal experience. That's determined by evolution. Now, human beings also have evolutionarily determined experiences and needs. One might say expectations, although these expectations are not conscious. And we evolved not as individual, disconnected, isolated, aggressive, competitive, mutually hostile creatures, but in small band hunter-gatherer groups where life was communal, where generosity and giving was not distinct from self-interest, where selfishness in the modern sense wasn't even known, where children grew up around adults, all kinds of adults, not just their parents, who all acted as the family, where children grew up amongst playmates of different ages and engaged in free play out there in nature. That's the, now, Jean Liedloff in her wonderful book, The Continuum Concept, talks about how human beings are expectations for certain things. So our lungs don't just expect oxygen, they are an expectation for oxygen. Because in the absence of oxygen, our lungs will never have evolved. Mm -hmm. Same with the human organism. So human beings are an expectation for attachment, for closeness, for contact, for connection, for security, for communality. We are an expectation for it. To the extent that we suffer when we're oxygen deprived, we also suffer when those evolutionary needs are denied to us, which this culture is at the pinnacle of denying those needs, as we can see all around us in so many ways. So yeah, we suffer because we've got far away from our evolutionary nature. Now when it comes to science, there was a great scientist called the Buddha 2,500 years ago <laughs> who said that, look at a leaf or a raindrop and think of all the conditions that were necessary for the existence of a leaf or a raindrop. When you look at that leaf, it's not an isolated entity. It contains the sun in a form of photosynthesis and light. It contains the water from the ground, from the sky. It contains minerals from the earth. That leaf is a manifestation of the whole universe. So is every little thing in the world a manifestation of the whole universe. And so Buddha said, "Where the, without the one, there cannot be the many, and without the many, there cannot be the one. Then it is the Buddha's mo modern and recently deceased great um, heir, you might say, in spiritual life, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, mm -hmm. who talked about not being but interbeing. It's not that we are, we inter-are. Now come, comes modern science. And this is modern science that's not controversial. It's been published and documented over and over and again, except it's completely unknown to my profession, the medical profession. Mm -hmm which is that the individual organs are part of a body. That body is inseparable from the mind, so that it's much more scientific to speak of the body-mind, as some researchers have, than of body and mind, so that there's, an, there's, a, there's a unity of mind and body. Furthermore, there's interpersonal mind-body, because <clears throat> my mind and how I treat you and how I talk to you and how I, how I relate to you will affect your mind, which will affect your body, which means that not only is our neurology interpersonal, so Dan Siegel, who, who both is a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and a trained physician and, of course, a meditation advocate, a mindfulness advocate, uh, he talks about interpersonal neurobi neurobiology. Now, as a physician, I take that a step further and I say, yes, and that also creates interpersonal biology which means that our biology is inseparable from an environment. And that environment includes not just the physical factors, such as, you know, food and climate and, you know, soil conditions and so on, but also our emotional climate, given the inseparability of, of the mind-body unit. And so therefore, interconnection is the theme in my book. And it's the sense that that interconnectivity is denied in practice, ignored, even it, it leads us down the wrong, all kinds of wrong paths when it comes to understanding illness and health, let alone the true nature of human beings or how we should relate to one another. 
when you were first starting to speak, I thought of Thich Nhat Hanh, and I thought about how many times I have seen him lecture in different contexts where he'd, he'd hold something up. Uh, mm-hmm. The last time I saw him was in New York City some years ago. Um, he held up a sunflower, and he would say exactly what you said, basically. Um, can you see all the non-sunflower elements in the sunflower? Like, see the sun, yeah. see the wind. You know, see the uh, fields in which it was planted, and um, it was this beautiful interplay of uh, elements, and, and seeing that everything is connected and influencing one another. And in a way, the inference was, however alone we might feel, and however cut off we might feel, that that is actually not true. Yes, that the truth of things is is contingency, it's connection, it's uh, relationship that we are all related to one another and, and life is that kind of complex of things. So it was lovely to hear you bring him up, you know, very explicitly. And, well, and if I may add, um, traditional people's ancient wisdom has always known this. Modern science has proved it over and over and over again. Yet as a culture and certainly as a medical culture, we've forgotten all about it. Mm-hmm. So my, my friend, the um, <clears throat> part Lakota physician and, uh, and psychiatrist, um, Dr. Louis Mel Madrona um, told me that um, in the Lakota tradition, when somebody got ill, the, com- the community would in effect say to them, thank you, your illness is manifesting some dysfunction about our whole community. Mm. So your healing is our healing. And not that you have this mysterious, isolated pathology striking some organ of yours in your body but that your illness and whatever when it shows up manifests something about our whole um, conjoint existence. And then when you understand that, and then you look at the scientific evidence, for example, that the more episodes of racism a black American woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma, Mm -hmm. or the more stressed the parents are, the greater the child's risk for asthma, or... The fact that in Canada, my country, an indigenous woman has six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis than that of anybody else, despite the fact that our indigenous people used to have no rheumatoid arthritis whatsoever before colonization. That should tell us something about the interconnection of things and how a cultural environment, in this case, one of terrible abuse, exclusion, and oppression, mm-hmm. um, shows up in the bodies of of individuals. And then do, they go to a doctor, and now you got inflamed joints, here's a pill. You know, but, but there's no connection made mm-hmm. between that person's mm-hmm. life and, and the culture in which that person lives and the identified pathology. I remember, um, and I don't know if it's still a prevailing use of language or theory, in uh, Western psychotherapy, but uh, for a while, um, I remember when I got back from India and was first really kind of looking at, at those other schools of thought, and um, you know, would see things about the identified patient, mm-hmm. like as a family would come and say, you know, little brother is like bad, you know, or yeah. <laughs> really a problem. That's the problem, and. Uh, the concept of identified patient was interesting because it seemed to place things back in the system, mm-hmm. just as you're talking about. Yeah, when I see an addicted person, I'm seeing a multi-generational family is what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. A multi-generational family in the context of a certain culture. So that person is simply the canary in the mine, mm-hmm. the most sensitive one who has downloaded maybe the most pain and therefore is the greatest need to escape from the pain, which is what all addictions represent. So again, this whole idea in Western medicine that addictions are genetic diseases. A, they're not genetic and B, they're not diseases. Mm -hmm. They're responses to the environment and particularly to the environment of pain on the part of very sensitive people who find it an escape temporarily from that distress to engage in some addictive behavior, whether it's to do with drugs or, or, or behaviors, whether it's pornography or gambling or shopping or mm-hmm. whatever it is, which also means that the healing 
mm-hmm. needs to happen on a criminal level, ideally, if that's possible. So I'm fascinated by this idea of those who download more suffering, you know, for whatever reason. So is that one way you might describe trauma? Mm, th- th- those people are more prone to be traumatized. Uh-huh. But that's not how I define trauma. Now, those okay. people are more prone to be, and I can talk about what trauma is, but yeah. the reason those people are, are the canaries in the mind is they don't inherit diseases. Like you don't inherit addiction. You don't inherit psychosis or depression, contrary to all the genetic mythology out there. There's been no gene ever found that if you have it, you'll have either an addiction or a mental illness of some kind. There's no gene that's ever been found that if you don't have it, you will not have an addiction or a mental health condition. There's no group of genes that if you have them, you'll have a certain medical or mental health condition, nor any gene found that if you don't have it, you won't have that condition. What they have found. Now, there are certain genes for certain illnesses. One of them runs in my family, muscular dystrophy. If you have that gene, you're going to get the disease. Mm-hmm. There's certain genes for ovarian breast cancer. If you have that gene, you won't necessarily have the disease, but your risk is much, much higher. But out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have that gene. Mm. So there is the only thing they found when it comes to mental health is that there's a large disparate group of genes that the more of them you inherit, the greater your risk for any mental health condition, whether it's ADHD or depression or anxiety or psychosis or bipolar illness or whatever. But you can have those same genes and be a wonderfully functioning human being. So what's being inherited, in fact, better than average. So what's being inherited is not disease, but sensitivity. Mm. And the more sensitive you are, the more affected you are by the environment, which also means that if the environment is traumatizing, you're more likely to be traumatized because you're that much more sensitive. That's mm-hmm. not a in, in a, in a, in a nurturing environment, you'll be that much more intuitive, a creative, um, socially adept, and a leader or a shaman or somebody like that, you know, artist. <clears throat> now, trauma, therefore, is not that sensitivity. Trauma is what happens not to people, but inside people. So trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is not the sexual abuse or the loss of a parent or a parent being jailed or or wartime or hmm, any number of occurrences. Those are not the trauma. Those are the traumatic events. Trauma, coming for the Greek word for wound or wounding, is the wound that you sustain as a result of those events. Now, clearly, the more sensitive you are, the more vulnerable by the way, vulnerable simply means woundable, vulnerary to wound. So the more sensitive you are, the more vulnerable you're going to be, and the more likely you are to sustain a wound, which if it persists, is what the trauma is. Now, the good news here is that trauma, if the trauma was what happened to you all those years ago, if my trauma was simply the fact that as a Jewish infant under the Nazi regime in the Second World War in Hungary, that's over with. That's never not going to have happened. But if the trauma is the wounds, the psychic wounds that I sustained as a result, those can be healed any time. And that's the same for any kind of trauma. Let's talk about love and compassion for a moment because it's, I'm being drawn there and this, you know, listening to you and which is wonderful. Um, but also words that can be hard to define and, and the role that they might play. And the reason that it came up in my mind, I think, is that I've spent uh, so many of the the last years of my my teaching Mm -hmm. working very specifically with the people we tend to call caregivers. Well, I'm not sure that's a powerful enough word. Mm -hmm. Um, People who, whether in their family life or their professional life, are kind of the helpers in the world, you know. Um, I don't mean in a, a... a bad way, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. but you know, the, the people like healthcare workers, social workers, therapists, first mm-hmm. responders. Um, and sometimes they're working in, in the field of great trauma, other people's trauma and often become burdened by it themselves, not just tired or, or burnt out, but really, you know, life becomes meaningless and it, mm-hmm. it is sort of a traumatic response. And 
uh, we call it vicarious trauma. And one could say, um, these are people, as as we know, you know, can have enormous compassion for others, and uh, but they're burning out for some other reason. And the rest mm-hmm. of society, we may look at, you know, and we see the coldness or we see the cruelty, and we think, where is the compassion for everybody? Um, mm-hmm. But but they're they're both kind of troublesome in different ways. Well, first of all, I would flatly assert that there's no such thing as vicarious trauma. Okay, let's go, let's go there. There's either trauma or there's no trauma, but there's no vicarious trauma. Uh-huh. Um, being a healthcare worker myself, I can tell you my sense of what this is about. Yeah. So first of all, who goes into those, that kind of work in the yeah, first right, place? Right, right. You know, very often it's people who in childhood undertook the role of being the caregivers long before they were ready for it. Mm-hmm. They've had to take care of the emotional needs of their parents by suppressing their own. Now, I can tell you that medical training demands that you suppress your own needs and you don't even think about them. Mm-hmm. That's true in healthcare training in general. So first of all, the kind of people drawn to that kind of work are, t- to a significant degree, activated by genuine idealism and mm-hmm. compassion and metta. But on an unconscious level, they're also driven to take care of others in order to feel okay about themselves. Mm-hmm. Because that's how they had to survive their childhoods. So those are the people that tend to become healthcare givers. And, you know, given the message I got as a Jewish infant and the Nazis that I wasn't wanted, mm-hmm. that message came through my mother's stresses and her grief and her, actually her giving me to a stranger because she couldn't keep me alive anymore. Mm-hmm. The message I got, I wasn't wanted. And if you're not wanted, as I've often said, go to medical school. You'll mm-hmm. be wanted all the time. Mm-hmm. But that emptiness that I'm not wanted for who I am, only for what I do, never gets satiated. Mm-hmm. So that's the first point. So who, who goes into that work in the first place? Secondly, um, as I describe in my book, in my su- chapter on psychedelics, it was some shamans in the Amazon jungle who pointed out to me, who knew nothing about me as an individual. They weren't impressed with my books because they never heard about them. (laughs) They weren't impressed with my reputation because they weren't familiar with it. But they said to me, you've absorbed, evidently you've absorbed so much trauma from working with so many traumatized people and you've never cleared it out of yourself. Mm -hmm. Now we as shamans, we absorb people's energies, but we know how to clear it out of ourselves and each other. Now nothing in the training of healthcare givers prepare them clear the traumatic energy that they absorb from their clients out of themselves. They're just expected to suck it up and keep going. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is that the trauma is not vicarious. It's actual. It's, that it's not because of somebody else's trauma that you're witnessing. Mm-hmm. It's because of the trauma in yourself that you haven't dealt with and the ongoing absorption of other people's traumatic energies. There's nothing vicarious about that. And so, and actually, to, 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 to complete this line of thought, yes, Sharon, these people show a lot of compassion to everybody except themselves. Yeah, I was trying, I tried to phrase it very carefully <laughs> to imply that because I, I actually completely agree with you. I've been thinking about the people drawn often to these professions or to these roles, you know, where you're... Yeah giving it all how difficult it can be to receive, you know, just the way we're taught. And and uh, the idea of having compassion for yourself is sometimes an affront, you know, like, yeah, I, I you know, I should be strong. I should be, yeah, uh, you know, very strong and, and I shouldn't need anything and, and all of that. And it's very, it's very complex. It's very difficult. And in fact, when, <laughs> when people talk about compassion fatigue, Nobody gets tired from being, uh, nobody gets fatigued from being compassionate. Being compassionate is part of our true nature as human beings. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a great killer who tries to murder the Buddha and then is transformed by the Buddha's compassion becomes the most compassionate and gentle creature because that's his true nature. You know, so we don't get tired of being our true nature. Compassion fatigue is actually lack of compassion fatigue. In other words, lack of compassion for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's when the compassion only flows one way, but it doesn't come back at us because we don't allow it in because we have to be strong, et cetera, et cetera. So 
There's no vicarious trauma and there's no compassion fatigue. There's trauma and there is lack of self-compassion fatigue. Mm-hmm. That's what we get fatigued by. And, and that's nobody's fault, by the way. It's just how we're programmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I'm wondering if, you know, some of the things we started talking about, like looking at culture, looking at the system, looking at the bigger picture, and seeing the place of our own woundedness or pain within that is one of the ways to open up to that kind of self-compassion because, first of all, it's true, you know, and understanding how things are is always helpful. And uh, just to have that sense of not landing so much on our own agency it's all my fault i should have been better i've you know been in therapy forever why aren't i better why am i still doing this and um that can be quite a load as well well when i when i hear that kind of statement i mean i teach a lot of therapists and uh Mm -hmm. when i hear that kind of statement in the part of a therapist colleague or, or or say a client i would simply turn it around and i say okay if i came to you and i'm 78 now which i am and if I came to you and I said, uh, I, I'm struggling here, you know, I, I've had a lot of therapy, but um, I've done a lot of self work, but this particular thing, it just challenges me. Would you say to me, would anybody say to me, Gabo, you should be ashamed of yourself, 78, you should have figured this out by now, for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. You've been a therapist for years and you've written all these books and you're still struggling. Would anybody say that to me? Nobody would. They would say, Oh, I get it. How can I help you? So, in other words, this this self-talk that we direct against ourselves, that we should have known this already, is simply another impact of trauma, Mm -hmm. which is where where we kind of give ourselves the shame-based perspective on ourselves. We would never treat anybody else that way who came to us for help. Well, that also makes me think of, you know, that very delicate place of feeling some responsibility for, let's say, the state of suffering we're in, which is also empowering. Like, what am I going to do about this as compared to being ashamed or mm-hmm. um, being uh, taking too much on, like ignoring the system, ignoring just the, the wealth of conditioning we have and and so on. And so there's a place in there where we can land, I think, you know, and, and find balance where uh, we feel empowered by the prospect of, of making change and yet not falling into that pit of shame and, and self-blame and so on. Well, there's, um, as I think you and I will agree, there's a huge difference between responsibility and self-blame. Mm-hmm. Responsibility, not to be trivial about it, but we've heard this many times, response ability, the capacity to respond. Well, Mm -hmm. without that, we have no agency. We have no way out. So we have to be responsible. And the question is, how do we help people get to that point of response ability? But that's not the same as blame. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as shame. That's simply, this is my issue. I mean, yeah, um, what may have happened to me under the Nazis happened to me, Mm -hmm. but who else can respond but me today Mm -hmm. to what I'm caring about that? You know, and uh, so responsibility is essential. Blame is a toxic burden. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, a a different note, community seems such an important aspect of healing. And yet community can also be a source of great toxicity. So how do we find or create healthy community for ourselves? Well, so one of the essential themes in my book is what I call this tension between authenticity and attachment. And uh, authenticity, from the word auto, for self, is simply our capacity to know our emotions fully and to experience them fully and to know how to act on them when necessary. So you can see that in any creature in nature, which is where we evolved, if they're not in touch with their emotions and their gut feelings, how long do they survive? They don't. So authenticity is, is, an, is an essential need for all of us. And much pathology ensues when we, when we disconnect from our authenticity, from our true selves. Now, that's one need that we have. Another huge need that we have is attachment, which is the need to belong to somebody. Now, that's true throughout the human lifetime. 
We know the price that loneliness exists. Loneliness is as much of a risk factor for health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So uh, attachments are important through the human lifespan, but never more important and never more indispensable than in infancy and childhood. Mm-hmm. When without those attachment relationships, we simply don't survive. So now we have these two needs, attachment and authenticity. But what happens if we're being our true selves and we're experiencing our true emotions, we find ourselves in an environment that doesn't want to see them, recognize them, let alone accept them. Then in for sheer survival's sake, we push down, we disconnect from our authenticity in order to attach. Now to come back to your question, uh, we need to build communities where we can both be ourselves and connect. Mm-hmm. And not have to give up the connection in order to be ourselves, so we're totally by ourselves, and not have to give up our two selves in order to belong to the community. So that means being very conscious about who we associate with and who we create community with. Uh, those two conditions, attachment, which is acceptance and love and connection, they have to be there, but so does authenticity. But the child had no choice. When the, when the child is small and they are faced with this dilemma of do I choose attachment or authenticity, they have to go for the attachment unconsciously. Therefore, mm-hmm. they give up themselves. And as adults, it's very of an illness, physical or mental, that wakes us up to a lack of authentic existence. But now the d- dilemma we have is, well, some people, if I become authentic, won't like me very much. hmm as a child, I had no choice in the matter, but now I do. So people also find to their great surprise that the more authentic they become, the more they attract other people who are willing to celebrate their authenticity. Mm. But in the beginning, it can be a tough choice. It's almost like leaving a cult. You know you know how extreme that can be. Mm. You know, uh, how, how if you never belong to a cult, you'll never know, I, I haven't except the human cult, you know, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, but you talk to these people, it's just gut-wrenching and heart-rendingly difficult for them because they're so want to attach, they mm-hmm. so want to belong, they so want to be seen and accepted. But then they find, if I'm truly myself, I won't be. So then they make the decision, okay, I'm going to give up this attachment for the sake of being authentic. Well, all of us face that cult or no cult. All of us face that tension in our lives, in our personal relationships, in our relationship to work, in our relationship to society. Well, in your book, you have a whole section exploring healthy child development. Is that where you feel the answer lies to many of the wellness challenges we face, like going back there and looking at that? You talk in the book about a child's non-negotiable needs. Yeah, which begin in utero. So there's a chapter on interuterine life. And now we know from all kinds of science that a mother's stresses translate into stresses on a child and have an impact on a child's development. So that if we have to begin somewhere, let's begin at conception. Mm-hmm. And let's begin at the kind of care that pregnant, mamas get, pregnant mothers get and the kind of conditions under which they have to live and work and their relationships, are they supportive or not? We have to start attending to that for the sake of the future child as we know from all kinds of science. Then there's how we birth in our society. Birth in our society has become largely mechanized, alienated, and tramples on both the mother's and the infant's need. Now, medical interference, or I should say medical intervention, can be life-saving and essential and elegantly beautiful sometimes, mm-hmm. as I've practiced and seen. Um, but... The interference that now we impose on human labor, it's it's beyond, beyond. In many countries, including here in my own province of British Columbia, there's a cesarean section rate of 40%. 40%. It shouldn't be any more than 10 or 15%. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge interference. Then there's the fact that in the United States, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth to be, for, for surely economic reasons. That means a massive abandonment of a quarter of Americans' children because that's how the infant experiences it. 
the mother doesn't mean to abandon the child, mm -hmm. but that's what. But the infant only experiences rejection. Can't help it because he, she, they need to be with that mom at the minimum of nine months, and actually for much longer than that, for healthy development. And then, then comes the parenting advice that so-called experts, psychologists, and psychiatrists, and parenting teachers dole out to young parents, which a lot of it has to do with, you try to control the child's behavior by denying the child's emotional needs for contact. Mm -hmm. Well, that's toxic to child development. It runs contrary to evolution. Try to tell a mother baboon to ignore the child's distress. Mm. See, where will that get you? So, if we're going to begin somewhere, Sharon, we have to begin with conception and birth and, and early childhood. That's a good beginning. That's a good place to begin. Do you think it's ever too late? I mean, I ask that quite sincerely. You know, like, uh, do we just say at some point, um, damaged or, you know? Well, like, what, would the Buddha have, what would the Buddha have said about that? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, we never say that. Yeah, well, there you go. Why would I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I? <laughs> you who might have I a different to, viewpoint. Who am I to argue with the Buddha? You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a good perspective. <laughs> That's great. No, I don't think it's ever too late because, again, the wound is not the the trauma is not what happened to you. It's the wound that you sustained, and wounds mm -hmm. they can be healed. They can be healed. It's a lot of work, a lot of awareness, um, maybe a lot of support that we need, but it's not beyond anybody who's got consciousness. And that's why the longest section of my book is actually not just outlining the toxicity and the manifestations of toxicity in terms of health in our culture, but all the longest chapter, the longest segment of the book is actually on healing, which, by the way, I didn't plan that way. It just turned out that way. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, and I think rightful. You know, I think that's appropriate. Yes. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, people have different manifestations in their life of support. You know, people who come together who, who have mm -hmm. faith in you when you have no faith in yourself or, mm -hmm. you know, cast a different vision of what they think of you. Um, mm -hmm. And it is hard, of course, you're right. And and something it's very hard. But um, I, I encounter that kind of doubt a lot and I just don't, I never believed it. You know, somehow from the first time I encountered the Buddhist teaching was the first time I felt included. Mm. Really, you know, in that kind of sphere of possibility, and they were never separate for me. Um, it was always the same. Like, oh, the Buddha thinks I can do it. In effect, you know, like well, look at that. You know, me too. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Well, so then you've been you've had a different project trajectory than mine because um, um, I've never been inside anybody's teachings deeply enough to unconditionally accept whatever they say. That's the first mm -hmm. point. Yeah, yeah. And but the second point is more is that I even after decades of experience as a physician and a healer and a teacher, I had this sort of fixed emotional position that I can help everybody else, but I can't be helped myself because I was mm -hmm. wounded too mm -hmm. early and too deeply and it's too ingrained. Now intellectually I knew that that wasn't the case, that couldn't be the case. I mean how would I be the only one? Since mm -hmm. I didn't believe about anybody else, how could it be true for me? Mm -hmm. Intellectually, I know that. But, you know, this intellectual awareness doesn't necessarily translate into an emotional absorption of that truth. And it was fairly recently that I have been able to let go of that fixed belief of mine. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, again, I would have vigorously and <laughs> eloquently argued against it at any time. Yeah. But to let go of it on the personal level... I, I didn't have that faith that you did, that since the Buddha said it, therefore, it must be true. I had to really learn that for myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think we all do learn it. I think the question is, you know, we have to learn it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think for so many of the people I encounter, there's this fundamental, deep, deep fundamental belief that they will be left out of that sense of possibility. Yeah. And, yeah. and so they, they stop. And the important thing is not to stop growing. And Yeah. 
changing and, and so on. So, um, I mean, you speak a lot in the book about compassionate inquiry, mm-hmm. which uh, now there would be a role for compassionate inquiry to our own uh, kind of fundamental beliefs about what we're capable of. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you could say something about the role of compassion in our healing. So, I, in my compassion inquiries, on the one hand, just very specifically, the name of a course of, or at least an approach to therapy that that developed out of my work with the help of many others, and now is a year-long immersive course that people can take online. These are for, this is for therapists and physicians and counselors and you know body workers anybody who works with human beings in that sense so th- that's a specific meaning it's a p- specific course of study there's a layperson version of it as well that's not participatory but it's self-guided and so on but apart from the course of compassion inquiry it's also just an approach to to life and to understanding ourselves and w- what does compassion mean anyway well again if you look at the meaning of words um, passion means to suffer, Latin. Like the passion of Christ refers to the suffering of Christ. And calm means with. To, to suffer men with means simply that when I see you suffer, I feel some pain. It hurts me. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to suffer. And I, and I feel with you. It doesn't mean I'm suffering to the same degree or whatever, but, it, but it, it's, a, it's a discomfort for me to see you suffer. Um, but that's not enough because as Thich Nhat Hanh pointed out so eloquently so often, you can't help somebody underst- unless you understand the source of their suffering. Mm-hmm. So that's what I call the compassion. That's the second level. The first one is what I call ordinary human compassion. The second is, is the, what I call the compassion of understanding. So, yeah, you might not want to see somebody addicted, but if you think their addiction is an inherited disease, you can't help them. Mm-hmm. But if you understand that what, what they have is a pain response to adverse life circumstances, now you can understand that in engaging in the addiction, they're just trying to soothe themselves. Mm-hmm. But that's the compassion of understanding. Now you can actually help them. The third level is what I call the compassion of recognition, which <clears throat> is simply the awareness that whatever is in you is also in me. So that when I was working with this highly addicted population here in Vancouver's downtown east side, you know, people hooked on heroin and cocaine and crystal meth and everything else and with their HIV and their hepatitis C and I'm being a middle class successful physician, but there's nothing about them that I didn't see in myself. The same the, the emptiness, the pain, the desperation, the willingness to manipulate, to pursue the habit, all that was in me as well. My circumstances have been a lot more fortunate. That was the only difference. That's what I call the compassion of recognition. Um, the fourth level um, is what I call the compassion of truth, which means that what we're committed to is not to make pe- not to make people feel better, but as somebody once said, but to help them, um, uh, not to make them feel better, but to make them better at feeling. In other mm. words. Mm -hmm. to really know what's in their bodies. Now, what your body carries may be painful sometimes. But if I'm committed to the compassion of truth, I will not protect you from feeling the pain that's already in you. I will not not impose pain on you. I will not create situations so that deliberately so that you feel pain. But when that pain shows up, I'm going to help you see that that's the truth of your existence as you've been living it until now. Not vindictively, but so that you can do something about it. So the compassion of truth is not just about trying to make make people feel better, but actually to help them to see. And uh, compassion is really needed for that because as A.H. Almas points out, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fifth level of compassion that I call the compassion of possibility, but perhaps I'll forego explaining that now. But... What I'm saying is that compassion exists on these different levels Mm -hmm. and we have to be in touch with them all to really help ourselves and everybody else. 
Well, because you're perhaps best known for your work with addiction, I want to um, come to that uh, before we come to a close. So there have been a lot of strides, it seems, in the past decade with new treatment models, some great new approaches with plant medicines. With um, it, It's kind of a different vision, more along the lines of, I think, what you're saying, uh, rather than you know so much like a, a disease model. For example, and uh, can you talk about how that work is evolving? Well, I will agree that um, a trauma-based understanding of addiction is um, getting more and more accepted, mm-hmm. but it's still an outlier when it comes to medical practice, mm-hmm. and it's still an outlier when it comes to the twelve-step programs, and it's still an outlier when it comes to a lot of addiction facilities who still see addiction as kind of this disease thing. Mm-hmm which is a step forward from seeing it as a moral choice mm-hmm, or a mm-hmm. failure of will. But it's still short of the mark. So I do have these two chapters in the book about what is really addiction really all about. Mm-hmm. Plant medicines, yes, specifically. Um, there are certain specific plants that you can even use to prevent withdrawal from opiates. Most physicians have never heard about it. It's illegal in North America, naturally. Naturally. <laughs> But it can perform miracles uh, in terms of opiate addiction. So I have a lot of experience with and therefore reverence for psychedelic modalities. But um, those who will, you know, as, as, as popular as they're becoming, they're very expensive, they're culturally strange, and they're not generally available. It'll be a long time before they are, especially for addictions. So it's it's great to see that modality arising and gaining credibility and I've very happily and I would say successfully worked with it um, for over a decade now. Mm-hmm. But I don't see it as sort of the Messiah coming. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't see a Messiah coming at all mm-hmm. until we as a society recognize the many ways in which our culture generates addictions in people, profits off addictions of all kinds, behavior addictions and Substances of all kinds, junk food, sugar, um, gambling, pornography, work. Um, consumerism itself is an addiction process. And then consumerism itself is at the very heart of capitalist culture. So until we look at the larger picture and deal with some of the sources, it's always going to be a rear guard battle. Although, in individual cases, a process that can be very successfully and beautifully engaged in, thank God. Mm-hmm. Mm. Amen. So to to close our conversation, although I hate to let you go, I'm sure I should, uh, I'd like to invite you to lead everyone listening in some kind of uh, reflection or practice. Sure. So... That's not so hard because I can crib right from my own book here. Um, (laughs) Excellent. Plagiarizing myself. So one of the dynamics that I've seen lead to illness of all kinds is the difficulty people have saying no to the demands and expectations of other people in the world. I'm talking about when there's a no that wants to be said, but you don't say it. One of the books I've written called When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress. Because a lot of chronic illness, not all, but a lot of it, in fact, the majority of it occurs to people that just don't know how to say no. Why don't they know how to say no? You've never met a one-day-old baby that doesn't say how to say no, at least in gesture and voice. And the first thing that people start saying at age one and a half is not yes, but no. Come to dinner, sweetheart. No. Time to put your shoes on. No. Well, why is that? Because if we don't know how to say no meaningfully, our yeses don't mean a thing. But in a lot of families, unfortunately, in the modern world, the child's no becomes a threat to the parents. And the child has to take on the expectations and needs of the parents, suppress their no's. That is a significant source of pathology, which I won't explain how or why now, but I do explain in both the body says no and in his new book, The Myth of Normal. So not saying no is a significant problem. Not saying no, it is a no that wants to be said, but you don't utter it. So here's the exercise, okay? Now this is something I lay out in much more detail in the book, but just for now, 
as you're listening, ask yourself this question and ponder it for one minute of silence. Where in, in important areas of my life, what am I not saying no to? But, and I'm talking about a no that shows up that you want to say, but you don't, or the no that wants to be said, but you don't utter it. Now, to give you a hint, this usually show up in two major areas of our lives, personal relationships, friends, partners, and so on, parents, um, and it shows up in work. So here's the question, which I'm asking all of you to ponder for, let's just say 60 seconds for now. In important areas of my life, where is it that I don't say no? Okay, so that's the first question. The second question I invite you to ponder now is, how does my inability to say no impact my life? So what happens within my body or within my psyche when I don't say no? Somebody asks you for coffee. You're tired. You had a busy day. You have preparation to do. You don't feel like saying, you don't, you don't want to go, but you say, yes, I'll be there. What is the impact on you? Your partner asks you to have sex with you. You don't feel like it. But you say yes, because you don't say no. And so on. At work, you're invited to take on, asked to take on more responsibility, but you're already carrying more load than you want to. You don't say no. So what is the impact on you of not saying no? What's the impact on your body and on your psyche? That's the second question. And... Uh, Please begin to ponder that one. Okay, that's the second question. Now, the third one, which I'll articulate for you in a moment, is based on my understanding as a physician and you know, all the science that I've looked at, is that your body sends you signals all the time. You just don't know that your body's sending you a signal. That signal could be fatigue, dry mouth, anxiety, poor sleep, overeating, undereating, a back spasm, stomach aches, frequent colds, um, whatever it is. So this question is, third question is, what body signals have I been overlooking? What symptoms have I been ignoring that could be warning signs were I to pay conscious attention? So basically I'm just asking you to take a body inventory 
of yourself over the last week or so? And what has your body been signaling that perhaps you weren't aware were signals? Not what was the signaling, what was the form of the signaling? What symptoms, what discomforts might have you been experiencing? So the question is, what bodily signals have I been overlooking? And we'll give that one minute. And we'll pay attention to your body on this one. All right, this uh, particular practice has six parts to it. We've just finished the third one. The fourth one is this question. Please ponder, what is the hidden story behind my ability, inability to say no? There's always a story there. If I say no, I'm a bad person. If, I'm, if I say no, um, they won't like me. If I say no, I'm letting people down. Whatever your story is, what is the hidden belief behind your inability to say no? And we'll give that one minute. Now, there's a fifth question to this exercise, which I'm going to uh, skip over for today's purposes, and I'll come right to the sixth one. Um, and it's kind of the obverse of where have I not said no. This is where I'm not saying yes, because there's something in all of us that we want to say yes to. But we're too busy not saying no. The yes gets crowded out. We have no time, space, or energy for it. And yet that yes that we're not saying is really crucial. Now, not saying no leads to a lot of stress in your life, believe me, on your body and on your soul and on your psyche. Not saying no leads to a lot of stress. But the person who did the pioneering modern research on stress, a man called Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E, actually, he was like me from Hungary, he came to Canada in the 1920s. And he's the one that showed the physiological impacts of stress in a laboratory. But he also said, what is in us, what is in us must out, must out. Otherwise, we may explode at the wrong places or become hopelessly hemmed in by frustrations. So there's some nature-given or God-given passion or calling or desire in you that you may be not making space for and giving expression. That will cause distress and even illness as surely as not saying no. So the last question for today then in this exercise is, when have I ignored, where have I ignored or denied the yes 
that wanted to be said. And we'll take one minute to see where you're not saying yes, where there's a yes that wants to emerge, but you're just not allowing space for it, where you're afraid to utter it. I hope that you found that little exercise um, illuminating and uh, maybe pointing to some aspects of your life that you may wish to explore more deeply. That concludes it. Thank you so much. It was, it was actually quite powerful. Um, so thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today. Sharon, it's always a pleasure, and I hope we get to do it many more often. I, I hope so, too. It is always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. To learn more about Gabor's work, you can visit Gabor Mate which is G-A-B-O-R-M-A-T-E dot com, or finds his latest book, The Myth of Normal, which is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audio formats. Big thanks to everyone listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, and may you live with ease. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.